Hi folks, I'm Abel James, and thanks so much for listening to the Fat Burning Man Show, where we talk about real food and real results. Today's show is one of my favorite shows ever. It's with one heck of a guy, Pedram Shojai, and basically, he's done everything. He's a knight, he's been chased by lions, lived as a hunter-gatherer, he's making films, writing books, just absolutely cool stuff. It's a really fun show. I think you're going to love it. Uh, Before we get to it, I just had a quick announcement. I wanted to thank you folks once again uh, for checking out our app, Caveman Feast, which is over 200 paleo recipes done with George Bryant over at Civilized Caveman. It's uh, been pretty shocking. We released it last week, uh, and it shot right up to number one in the food and drink categories and, and blew everyone like the Food Network out of the water. And then it went on to reach the top 10 app overall number six across the world which is just absolutely insane angry birds is 45 so all of a sudden we're competing with warner brothers disney ea these game development companies so it's been absolutely just shocking how much uh, attention there is around eating real food and we're super excited about that so to those of you who have picked up the app thank you so much Uh, to those of you who haven't and you have an iphone or an ipod touch or an iPad, you can head to the App Store and it's called Caveman Feast. You can check it out there or of course uh, on fatburningman.com. And I know a lot of you use Android or Windows and don't worry, we're working on an Android version very soon. Uh, Next, all we're doing right now is looking for a developer. So if you have any connections there, feel free to shoot them to me uh, at abel at fatburningman.com. So thanks to all of you once again. I hope you enjoy the app. All right, let's go on to the show with with Pedram. <laughs> we cover what it's like to live like a hunter-gatherer in Africa, literally. How being chased by lions is like meditation. Why we're not smart enough to watch TV. And how drug companies try to trick you with neuroscience. All right, let's go hang out with Pedram. All right, folks, we're here with Dr. Pedram Shojai, who might just be the most interesting man in the world. Among other things, he's an author, filmmaker, a seasoned martial artist, doctor of oriental medicine, priest, a Qigong master, studied with a Dalai Lama, and he's even a knight. Is that last one true? Is that... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm actually a hospitaler knight under two different hospitaler orders. Um, you know, just, it's, it's, a, it's a medical thing, but I got knighted uh, about a year and a half ago, and um, I, I travel and kind of do rural medicine uh, with these guys. Wow, that, that's awesome. I don't think I've ever interviewed a knight before. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome. Uh, you, you're yeah. obviously doing so many cool things. It's a pleasure to have you here. I'd love to start with uh, just the fact that you're you're such a spiritual person. Um, it seems like you're very in touch with the world as you believe it should be and the way it is for you. I know this is totally sounding woo-woo, but uh, we're all a bit out of touch, I think, with, with technology, huge cities, pollution, toxicity. Can you talk about uh, why that's a problem and how we can kind of steer ourselves into leading a healthier life. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the things I just did uh, about a year ago is I, I went to Africa and did a wilderness survival course, learning how to live with big game where our original ancestors came from. Cool. And it was it was it was so eye opening because first of all, you know, you, we talk about paleo and all these types of diets that are that everyone's getting into right now. It's you know, if you pull down an, an antelope, if you pull down a, a kudu, I mean, that's a party, yeah. right? It's like <laughs> you're you're cruising around eating a lot of roots and a lot of things that are high in fiber, very low in calories all day, every day, and, and it's like the day revolves around kind of foraging and moving and and knowing where the predator are, predators are and all that, and it it was so amazing having, you know, I got into a lot of my, my meditation training and my, my Taoist training and Kung Fu and all that, you know, in my early 20s. So, you know, as a young guy, if you would, right? And so for me to then kind of take that perspective into the wilderness and see what it meant to be 100% focused because you are hearing an alarm call of an animal and you've been tracking a lion for the last 25 minutes and then you hear that the wind changes and you hear the animals pick them up about 20 feet away and you know that you're about 20 to 30 feet away from a lion Mm -hmm. with paws this big. Uh, oh man, every hair on your neck stands up and you feel more alive than you felt in years. And it's like, it's the ultimate form of meditation because that's where we came from, right? right? 
we came from coexisting with nature. We came from coexisting with, with these, these really big animals that can eat you very easily, mm -hmm. right? And so it was this hyper-aware, hyper-connected sense of, of, of being that had everything to do with your environment, right? Uh, the closest thing we have to alarm calls of birds in the city right now is maybe uh, screeching car tires, if yeah. you will. And, yeah, you know, and a that fire truck or something yeah. for a fire truck where people would say, oh, what is that? And they, they kind of jump off. But mm -hmm. we've stepped out of that in such a kind of uh, in such a tragic way, if you will, because we are sitting at our desks. You know, we're, we're communicating via texts and iPhones and all these types of things where it's super useful. I'm not a Luddite in any way. I love my technology. We're using it right now to, to hang out. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but when you lose that perspective and you lose kind of the, the origins of where you come from, uh, Things start happening to the body. Things start happening to the mind. The dimensionality, really, of our existence starts to shift because you know, I, I grew up climbing trees. You know, I grew up throwing rocks and doing whatever we did as kids and getting into trouble. And now kids, you know, my, my sister's kid can't even go to go to the bathroom without an iPad. Right? Yeah. <laughs> this this, this two-dimensional world where they're just kind of stuck in this thing. And it's, it's really a lot more abstract than it is real in some ways. Yeah. And, and I think that there's a price to pay with consciousness and happiness and presence uh, when, when, you know, when we're discussing that. Yeah. Right? It's amazing how quickly it's happened and how pervasive it is. Actually, I was just, I was just flying back from Thailand and we had a layover in Qatar and there was an Angry Birds store, like, <laughs> like an entire store that was Angry Birds. And I'm like, wow, this really is a cultural phenomenon. So things like that really catch on, but it's not really putting us back in touch with, with who we are as people or how we can live a, a, a healthy, balanced life. What, uh, I think it was in one of your blog posts I saw that you do something kind of interesting before you enter the passcode on your iPhone. Can you mm -hmm. talk about that? Yeah, it's. I, I challenged my students at one point to, to really kind of find ways where they can pop in the clutch. Uh, in the middle of things that they're doing every single day of their lives. And one of the things that I caught myself doing all the time was putting in my passcode. Mm -hmm. So I thought to myself, oh, this is interesting. Um, it's I'm on autopilot, right? I'll hear a little bleep or whatever, and I'll just you know grab the phone and, and get in and see what my universe is telling me. And I said, this is a perfect opportunity. So, so what we do is we say, okay, change your passcode. Because the first thing is it's automated, right? And so you kind of you go into that that trance state as soon as something becomes uh, a, a ritual, right? And, and so what you do is you change your passcode, and then for me, I just say, okay, every time I pick up my phone and put in my passcode, that's a trigger for me to breathe down to my lower abdomen, pop in the clutch, and just step into the present moment for a second. And then go back into the rush of the world that I'm in, right? And one of the things that I've noticed is you got to change your passcode probably every three months because then you kind of go back into autopilot and you start yeah. to forget, right? right? So it's like when you get that red wrong passcode thing, you stop and you say, oh, right, this is when I was tr trying to remind myself to stop. Mm -hmm. And why is that beneficial, that deep breath to the abdomen? What does that actually do? Uh, many things, many things. Uh, one, it helps the diaphragm pull down better. So it helps oxygenate the system. Uh, two is it, it instantly triggers parasympathetic nervous system activation versus sympathetic. Mm -hmm. We're so fight fight or flight, you know, we're always, you know, when I was tracking that lion, that was the appropriate use of my fight or flight mechanism, right? It's, I could pick something up on my desk right now, open up an envelope and be like, what? $600 for a phone bill, right? <laughs> same, you know, the same hair might come up, right? And, and so the, the, the stress mechanism is being overused yeah. because of the way that we have uh, really kind of hyper evolved into an environment where uh, there's all sorts of inputs coming in that are in, in an abstract sense, maybe stress, right? Okay, well, if that costs that much, then I can't afford my mortgage and then I'll be, you know, not have a roof over my head and therefore it kind of can be a survival thing. Mm -hmm. But it's so far away from true survival that everything is just up here. It's just yeah. so abstract, right? And so uh, one of the things that I really like doing is getting people to drop out of that sympathetic overload. And it, it's kind of a binary system. Either you're going parasympathetic where it's just you're digesting your food and growing and being able to make love and, and, and being in kind of like a, a, a zen state of mind, or you're in sympathetic where you're just, you know, hey, w w what's out there? What's coming? What's going to get me, mm -hmm. right? And that's kind of where we live. Right. And, and that's where a lot of our healthcare crisis is coming from. A lot of the cortisol levels that are throwing people off, a lot of the insomnia. I mean, you look at 90% of the hospital visits, 70% um, straight away are, are, are secondary to diabetes in some way or another. Yeah. Right. 
And then the rest of it is basically a lot of stress and a lot of lifestyle stuff, Mm -hmm. right? And so if we could offset some of that lifestyle stuff by not being in stress and learning how to eat and taking care of ourselves, that's really the the, the secret formula to healthcare success. Yeah. Uh, and that's where, you know, I've kind of hung my hat over the last couple of years. You know, I, I, I realized pretty early on in, in my career that, you know, I'm not incentivized to take care of patients well because if they – uh, don't get well, they keep coming back for, 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 for care. Right. And that's where you make more money. And I thought to myself, well, this is, this is a horrible system, right? <laughs> <laughs> this, this is crap. You, you, you know, you can't not be wishing well for, for people that are under your care. And right. the, the financial model is set up in, in a very wrong kind of backwards way. Yeah. And so yeah. that's when I got into a lot of the, the educational initiatives and making movies and doing all the things that I do. Cause like, you know what, this is, this is nonsense. I got into this game to help people, right? Yeah. You want to make money, go into, go into banking where you can sell money. Right. <laughs> and it's so interesting too, um, not, not to draw a line here, but I think it's a, an example that I recently found, at least in my own life, I have, I have a dog and she's a young puppy and you know, they say that she needs certain vaccinations. And every time I go into the traditional vet, um, where she'd been since she was a young puppy before I even had her, it's, you know, several hundred dollars, but I've been looking for, you know, naturopathic vet, someone who, you know, I kind of share the same views on life and nutrition and diet with to bring her to. And it's almost impossible to find. I found one in New Hampshire when I was up there, but, um, she runs it out of her house and barely makes any money because the dogs that she treats are always well. (laughs) <laughs> because right. they're they're eating well, they're not really getting all of these problems that come from not eating well and not exercising and all this other stuff. So so how how can we manage that as a system for for people specifically? Uh, that is a great question. I mean, you look at the ancient Chinese model of medicine, and the doctor got paid to keep their patients well. If this, if the patient got sick, it's like, hey, what's wrong with this doctor? Yeah. Right. And so they'd kind of be left on retainer, right, and, and, and kind of front-loading their health care expenses so that it doesn't get expensive on the back end, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you go in for a stint, you go in for a cardiac procedure, you're in for thousands and thousands of dollars. Whereas, you know, if you start, you know, kind of front-loading that onto, you know, eating more broccoli and taking care of yourself and not needing it, um, you – have more energy, you feel well, you get a better mood and all that. So that's really kind of the question of the hour. And that's where a lot of things are shifting with Obamacare. And there's some good, there's some bad, there's some ugly there. Mm-hmm. But it's, you know, the debate in Washington is not a health care debate. It's a health care finance debate, right? Mm-hmm. Who's paying the bill has nothing to do with how well we are, right? right? And so the, the dialogue that we're stoking, you're stoking, everyone in, in kind of our sphere is stoking is like, what is health and how can we enhance that? You know, I use the word vitality. The title of our first movie is Vitality, right? And it's how do you build up the vitality of the system so you're feeling well and you're robust and you're overflowing and you want to help people and you want to take care of people and you want to go climb that rock instead of saying, oh, well, my shoulder feels a little better. My doctor said take it easy on it because, that, you know, you've gone so far that you're just weak and deconditioned, mm-hmm. right? And it applies to every realm of medicine. So it's really kind of a vitalistic versus a mechanistic system of medicine, right, yeah. where, you know, Dow Chemicals came in and said, better living through chemistry. Don't worry about it. Do whatever you want. We'll make a drug to fix it. Our generation now knows better. You know, we saw our our parents' generation crash and burn with it. And our grandparents are all locked up in some old age homes, stumbling around with Alzheimer's. So so you you stop and you say, what what happened? What happened? Where where is this model? Where did this model take us? And where do we need to go from here? And, you know, I know you'll, you'll have children at some point in your life. And we're looking down the barrel of, you know, having some kids and all that. And so what do you want for your kids? What do you want for the next generation? I don't want what my previous generation had. I'll tell you that. Yeah. So what did go wrong? Uh a lot of things, but you know what happened was we were really high uh, on on our advancements, if you will, mm-hmm. after World War II. You know, we 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 beat the bad guys. We were on top of the world. We were creating all sorts of chemicals for everything, and, and it was kind of like we, you know, we're now suffering the hangover from that. Yeah. But what happened was we truly did believe that science could fix everything. And it's not to say that I'm you know I'm not hating on science. I'm a scientist myself. But it became this un tethered 
approach to saying we're just going to create some chemical that's going to do this and and because you know uh, willow bark has this property if we isolate that and we you know quadruple it or, or go 50x of it then then too much of a good thing is a good thing yeah. and, and and so we we overshot the mark right and so now we're kind of falling back into that hangover phase of saying okay first of all stop killing the planet secondly what works and what doesn't work and third of all um what sense is it in letting people go so far out to then have to go back and fix it at three times the cost and mm. at, at so much, you know, family cost and, and interpersonal costs and all that? Um, and, and why are we not just staying well in the first place, right? Yeah. And so that whole model of crash and burn, I was literally just talking about this with a patient who's trying to, he's from the UK trying to figure out why the American system is so screwed up, right? <laughs> and, and their system is having their own problems now, right? Sure. But, you know, it's, it does it's not sustainable in that way and and when you start talking about the business of medicine it's you know it's a trillion dollar industry and so you start getting into this whole healthcare finance debate and you start you start ruffling some feathers and there's you know, people say well you know if 70% of the ER visits are due to diabetes if i were to come out today and say hey well man i got it you know what I just found the cure for diabetes. Um, I think there's going to be some people knocking on my door because all the hospitals are going to empty out. Yeah. That's millions and millions of jobs. It's the economy and all, it's all that. And you get the same thing with like, you know, nuclear submarines. It's like, oh, well, we should stop making these nukes because it's not good for us. So, well, well, we're going to lose 10,000 jobs in New Hampshire over this. Yeah. It's like, well, okay, can we reallocate those jobs to somewhere where it's not causing harm to the society just because it's – paying taxes and paying our bills doesn't mean it's right. And so yeah. it's it's becoming kind of a bigger societal debate about who we are and what we stand for and how we can have a little bit more responsibility with our, our capitalistic model. Mm -hmm. And I'm all down for capitalism. I think it's great. It drives innovation. But when you start blending capitalism and, and, and medicine, there's some real ethical lines that, that get crossed and, and it, it becomes a kind of a, a bigger uh, debate for all of us. Yeah. And things can really go sideways. I remember a few weeks back, I was looking at someone posted uh, on my Facebook fan page, this, this picture of a, a diabetic handbook, I think from like the, the early 1900s. And it had the recommendations for what um, diabetics should and should not be eating. Basically, it said, don't eat sugar, right? And it said, eat lots of fibrous, non-starchy uh, veggies, eat uh, a good helping of, of protein, eggs, things like that, um, and avoid sugar. And you look at what a lot of uh, is understood in conventional wisdom and medicine these days, and it's a far cry from that. You know, the, the, the intervention that's recommended for type 2 diabetics looks nothing like that. But if you look at that dietary handbook for diabetics from back then, it's like that's almost the paleo diet today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like how did that all happen in between? Uh, you know, that's it's, it's a big conversation. We'll touch on it a little. But basically – Look, I, I deal with a doctor who's doing he, who went back and looked at, at all the stuff from like the late 1800s and basically said, "Look, we had so much stuff. I mean, he, they were, we were using stuff for, you know, for pennies on the dollar that was working really effectively. Doctors were teaching people how to live and not worrying about you know what drugs to put them on, but just keeping them well. And then you know, started to become a business. Mm -hmm. It started to become a business, and the medical curriculum started to slowly get taken over by uh, pharma and research and so it's like hey yeah we'll do this research over at your institution but wink wink you know and so the algorithms of medicine started to become more and more pharmaceutically geared mm -hmm. and interventionally geared because that's where the, the the revenue was coming from right I mean it takes tens of millions of dollars to pass a medical device to the FDA and so you know you got to make that money up somewhere right and so it's it just became this big money game and then all that like kind of cheap uh, do-it-yourself sensible stuff started to get brushed under the rug because um, you know it wasn't sexy enough uh, and, and it really and you could get into conspiracy theories and all that kind of stuff but you know at the end of the day follow the money and, and the money started pointing towards more interventional stuff. So, you know, it's a lot easier to get a surgery uh, for bariatrics, right, and just, you know, eat all you want and then just go get the surgery than it is to be sensible from, from the get-go. And, sure. and that's just – it's crazy, right? And, and so, you know, and the rest of the world looks at America in that way and says, what, what, what's wrong with you guys, right? <laughs> Like, what, why are you, why are you even doing that? You know, like the obesity is doing this. And then so instead of, you know, stopping and being sensible, maybe going more paleo and eating right, we say, well, don't worry about it. We got a surgery for that or we got a pill for that. And that's just, it, you know, again, it's where I think where capitalism splashed on the beach of, of, of sensibility. Yeah. And that's where we're now trying to kind of 
find a new middle ground, you know, just so we could, you know, save ourselves, you know, 20, 20 or 25 percent of GDP mm-hmm. by 2020 is going to go directly to healthcare costs. Right. Why are we so sick? Yeah. Right. And, and that's really where the debate is heading. And so and I'm tired of Washington kind of leading that charge. So, you know, guys like yourself and me and all, you know, our generation of kind of charged, young, healthy dudes is, is, is really going for this and saying, like, ah, ah, enough's enough. Yeah. This yeah. isn't your world. Right. And so you don't get to make these decisions for me or we'll throw you out of office. And we're going to we're going to show this. We're going to show how this works in a better way. Yeah, I love that. And it's it's so interesting to what you mentioned about how ridiculous it's becoming. You know, I, I remember this was one of the first articles I wrote on on my blog. Actually, it was a CNN article about obesity in America or something like that. And basically that the whole thing was was kind of fine. You know, they're talking about things and, and talking about eating low cholesterol, low fat and eating diet foods and stuff like that. And it's like, well, that's to be expected. And then it said at the end, like the only recommendation for someone who can't lose weight through a diet is to get surgery to basically remove their stomach. And I'm like, wait a second. <laughs> what? <laughs> This is what you're recommending. It, it's I can't remember what it was, but it's something pithy like until we invent the perfect fat burner pill, like you're going to have to cut your stomach out. And it's like, what? Y- yes, thank you, thank you. It's and, and that's in print, right? And that mm-hmm. some some editor approved that, which is absolutely insane, right? Yeah. And that's that's where you really have to start questioning the reality of of, of media and connection to business and all that kind of stuff because it's really really sticky. And, and, you know, it's, if you go back to good, clean, healthy living, if you go back to understanding the basics about nutrition and exercise and, you know, that that was like our whole platform is, you know, when I was making the Vitality movie, the, the guys that I was originally working with, um, wanted to go into kind of some of this like kind of hippy dippy esoteric, like ways of curing cancer with machines and all that. And I'm, I'm sitting there scratching my head saying, guys, if we, just got people to eat more vegetables, we would cure 60% of these problems, right? <laughs> like the American healthcare crisis isn't because we haven't invented some pill or machine yeah. that's supposed to save us. You know, I think that's kind of crossed over into some of the way we look at religion and, and, and you know, we're going to take this to the brink and then like we're going to get saved somehow, mm-hmm. right? It's I, I think we need to wake up and understand that this is us and it's our world and it's our children's world and we need to not hope for some miracle drug to be invented. Yeah. Um, in some lab that that's trying to make money off of it, mm-hmm. and understand that you know the the true altruism is the altruism that you have towards your own body and your own family and your own garden, your own environment, your own microflora every single day, mm-hmm. right? It's how you live sensibly in your body and what that means. And there's a lot of wisdom, obviously, and one of the coolest things about uh, uh, the ancestral movement in, in looking back. Instead of looking forward and waiting for that perfect invention that's going to cure cancer, isn't it better to not get cancer at all and, and try to live your life in a way such that that's not a problem and diabetes isn't a problem and all these other things that are stacking up at, in America and, and throughout the world at this point? Uh, isn't it better to focus on that? And I think one of the coolest things about your experience is you do understand uh, the, the Eastern perspective, which has a lot, look, a lot more to look back upon. <laughs> so can you share a bit of the, the wisdom there? Like how can you live a life that's better in tune with who we are? Sure, sure, absolutely. I mean, I, look, I'm, I'm a Taoist priest. I studied you know, Kung Fu for many, many years of my life. And I got the stuff just ingrained in me while I was a young man, right? And it kind of became part of my operating system. You know, I don't have to click on the Taoist window to open up the application. Like it's just part of how I think. Mm-hmm. And Taoism is all about balance, right? Balance and everything. So when you look at it in terms of lifestyle, really the way I look at it is, okay, where, where's your diet at? Where's your exercise? Where's your sleep? And where's your mindset, right? And if you get those four running together, you have vitality in, in a very real effective way because, I mean, what really else is there in health? I mean, sure, we all come in with some genetic makeup and, and you know, daddy was an alcoholic and mommy had this and mommy had that. But, you know, a lot of those things we can't control, uh, you know, once we're in our baby bodies, right? It's what we do with it from there. Now, there's an argument to what you can do for your, for what you can do for your kids and prenatal medicine and all that, which I'm stoked about. And that's, that's a, that's a whole other conversation that I'm really charged about. We're actually going to do a whole series of, you know, movies and stuff on that, because I think that there's a tremendous responsibility for us to pay it forward into the next generation. But say you come in now, now what? Right. And so 
people will say, okay, you know what? It's all about what you eat, right? It's like I could tell you right now that you can eat pristinely, right? You can be paleo exclusive and do everything 100% correct in your paleo diet. But if you don't move and if you're up all night, you ain't feeling well, yeah. right? And and so you got to look at life holistically, and that's really where the Eastern stuff came in for me. Was what are the simple things in life, right? Mm-hmm. You need food, you need water, you need shelter, you need happiness. You know, it's nice, and you need friends and family and love around you. And then everything from there becomes kind of a layer of abstraction. They become need, not, are they needs or are they wants, right? The purse is a want, mm-hmm. honey. You know, I don't know, like this is something that I always debate about with my <laughs> wife all the time. It's like that's a want, that's not a need. You have six purses. Yeah. Right. Do you have or 1600, you know, whatever. It's like these are things that we need to look at in that way. You know, do you need the the bigger car or do you want the bigger car? Mm -hmm. Right. I drive a Prius. I love it. Right. And it's just it it just takes care of what I is my transportation need. Mm -hmm. I don't need to work so hard to float the overhead on an expensive lifestyle. So I'm always stressed about money. I'd rather be relaxed about money and then go hiking with my friends or go on a trip somewhere but not be spending it on stupid stuff. So yeah. the the desires that, that really come from the, the, the Buddhist tradition and then the balance that comes from the Taoist tradition have really helped flavor the way I look at things because yeah, okay. we're just insane. Right. And as a culture, we're insane. Right. It's all about what's the next thing we're going to buy. And, you know, we just did this whole thing on this brown cloud of pollution that comes up from China and in a few days drops into the Pacific Northwest and basically has increased the mercury levels in our water like hundreds of times in some of the lakes and stuff. Right. And it's yeah. And it's just coming from the coal plants that are making our shoes. Yeah. the, the, The six, 10, 20 extra pairs of shoes that we think we need in China. And so it's it's really easy to like point to China and say, oh, you bad China. But, you know, at the end of the day, we're the consumer, right? Yeah. And so a lot of that has to do with what, what our consumption habits are and whether or not we're supporting companies that are, that are uh, you know, doing things with a greener footprint or whether or not we really even need more of that stuff. Mm-hmm. And then, again, that kind of goes into the medical conversation about like, well, what, you know, what's going to happen to the economy? You know, if, if, if people stop going to the mall, you know, the whole – House of Cards is going to crash down, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, part of what I do and, you know, we're interviewing a bunch of different, you know, uh, uh, basically economists and people that are kind of up up on that topic is saying, look, how can we change the way we do business, the way we do capitalism in a way that's going to support the environment and support our generations to come Mm -hmm. instead of saying, well, if we stop this, then we're going to lose jobs and, 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 you know, the tax this whole thing's going to crash, right. right? It's just an insane argument and it's trying to perpetuate a, a diseased system. So we're trying to figure out ways of creating abundance within uh, models that are supporting good guys, mm-hmm. right? Like I like there's companies that we work with, you know, like well, you know, we're doing a thing with a company right now. It's just doing sustainably caught fishing, right? Mm-hmm. And so they're, they're only buying fish from people that are doing uh, it right, yeah. Right. And so look at that and say, yeah, I vote with my dollars. Right. I vote with my money. So I'm going to support those good guys. It might cost me a couple extra dollars, but I'm not going to lose the planet. Yeah. Right. I'm, you know, I'm not going to need to go do six thousand dollars worth of chelation later because I've got all this mercury in my system. Right. Mm-hmm. And again, and so what we're working on is health insurance models that are more delivery of the frontline stuff based. So like health savings accounts and all that kind of stuff where you're, you're spending the money on yourself on the front end Mm -hmm. and you're having a higher deductible. And like, if you get hit by a bus, you get hit by a bus. You got to go to the, you got to go to the hospital, right? I'm not a Luddite, you know, if you already have a disease, you go take care of that. You know, it's like, we have a lot of MD friends that are wonderful at what they do, but the preventative model on the front end is, you know, you want to not need them, Mm -hmm. right? You want to not need them um, unless you get carted in, and then yeah. you're very happy they're there. Right. <laughs> so let's talk about some of the some of the many projects you have going on. Obviously, uh, Well dot org is a fantastic one. You're working on some movies. Let's let's cover that a little bit. Sure, sure. So Vitality is the first movie. Vitality is really kind of the the, the whole framework that we set up. And what I did was. I stepped back and said, okay, how do we set up a model for for understanding health in a more simplistic way for America and the Western world to understand? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, you know, people who already know a lot about health, you know, a lot of them will say, "Oh, oh, oh, you know, I already know a lot of this stuff. But I didn't really design that movie for you, say, you, you're, you're a smart dude, you know exactly what's going on, right? But I designed it for the 10, 15 people in your life that just won't listen, right? 
And so we're getting a lot of people saying, man, I showed it to my uncle and he finally like he got up and he had breakfast yesterday. <laughs> right? and, and, and like, you know, he, he started he switched from coffee to green tea and, and, and that kind of stuff. And so we, we kind of created the foundational work there with Vitality. Vitality is right now getting uh, shopped to the different TV networks. It's, you know, basically we're taking pre-orders on Amazon and all that. And it's it's about to kind of blast out to the world. It's gotten really great reviews. So I feel very blessed to be able to take the show on the road with that, right? It was the stuff that I wanted to say to every patient that walked into my office, but didn't have time to say because the way it works is, you know, hey, there's another one waiting. And you're like, well, what, you know, the, the Latin root of the word doctor, docere means to teach, mm-hmm. right? Not to treat, but to teach, yeah. right? And so as a doctor, what are you doing? How are you helping people? And so this movie became the kind of propaganda vehicle for that. And, and, and it's phenomenal. And then so then we start following it with origins. And um, origins is basically where did we come from? How does this work? How does how does this relate to the environment that we're in and the natural environment? And that one we're actually cutting on now. And, and it's been a really fun process. You know, we, we we're, we've done a lot on, on paleo. We've done a lot on on kind of food allergies and all that. So we kind of we've been expanding that and, and, and really kind of filming all kinds of stuff. And then for our webisode footage and all that, we've been filming. You know, I just did a, a story on the, the banks that are fighting financing the green movement and the environmental companies that are doing good work up in San Francisco, right? It's like, again, I put my cameras on the good guys and say, hey, check this guy out, right? Because when you turn on, you know, a lot of this was influenced actually. Um, uh, my, my wife was watching TV one night and she's like, you never hang out with me. And I'm like, I just don't like TV. So, so I picked up my laptop and I just kind of sat there with her and just goofing off while she was watching some show. And I counted eight, able eight pharmaceutical ads during this half hour show that basically said, you don't feel well because you're not taking our stuff, right? Like, you know, just happy people kind of cruising around, doing their thing. And at the end, it's just this long kind of litany of like, you know, side effects, right? It's like, oh, if you, by the way, if you take this, you might die or your ear might fall off, but but, but tell your doctor, right? (laughs) And it was enough for me to say, okay, enough's enough. This is, I understand this is a propaganda game, right? And oh. so we, we need to get in. <laughs> it's so it's so wacky, isn't it? Like I was, uh, we usually don't have the TV on. In fact, we just move the TV into another room that we never really go into, um, so that it's a conscious decision every time we turn it on. But just um, just to <coughs> see what every once in a while, I like to listen to the radio or watch TV just to feel like I, I'm I'm seeing what other people are seeing for you know even a few minutes and. One of these propaganda (laughs) things from the medical industry comes out from a pharmaceutical company. And, I mean, they're all kind of the same. I mean, we know the narrative. It starts out and it's just like, buy our stuff or like all these happy people. You have a problem and this is the solution. And then it goes into the second half or the second two-thirds where they're talking about all of the horrible things that could happen to you, including death. (laughs) <laughs> as they're showing these visuals of like rainbows and like butterflies bringing you gold and all this crazy stuff. And, you know, I was, I was thinking that 20 years from now, if everything goes backwards, as they say, it's going to, you know, and we're trying to finance all this stuff. I feel like watching that on YouTube 20 years from now, we're going to be like, Oh, that's what we were doing wrong. You know what I mean? Like it's so glaringly obvious that this is bad. Um, and that we're yes. we're tricking people, um, but it's almost like we want to be tricked at this point. That's the only reason that it's working, right? Because it's it's so obvious that this is bizarre. So how can we address that? Yeah, you know what. I- First of all, you know, I think that, you know, you, right now we could look back at the cigarette commercials with the yeah. doc smoking a cigarette and, and endorsing it going, oh, oh my God, right? <laughs> I, think, I think you're astute in saying that, yes, you know, maybe even 10, 20 years from now, we're going to look back at these ads and say, this is insane. Look at, look at how far gone we were and look at where society was. Yeah. But one of, the, one of the things that, you know, and this is going to tie us kind of back into the Eastern philosophy, and I can't help it because that's where I hail from. I love it. Um, when... Oh, God, um, I'm blanking on the guy's name. The guy who founded modern hypnotherapy, Erickson, Milton Erickson, was asked in an interview, what is it like putting people into trance all the time? And his, his response was very powerful for me because he, he looked at the interview and he said, look, I don't think you understand what it is that I'm doing here. I'm taking these poor people out of their trances every day. Mm-hmm. Everyone's sleepwalking. Right. And so when you talk about these like rainbows and images of like Labradors and like, you know, happy people walking around while there's this list of like, you know, you're going to die stuff happening on TV. You have to understand that there's 
a tremendous amount of neuroscience that has gone into understanding how our brains work and function and how we can fall into trance as we're sitting there in front of the tube and just be like, oh, yeah, you know, I think I need some Lunesta. Yeah. Right. And, and it's just suggestion and suggestion and suggestion until finally you just believe it and you don't even realize what happened to you. Right. And so I always say I'm not smart enough to watch TV. Right. <laughs> Because if I come home tired after a long day of like, you know, fighting the good fight and I plop down next to my wife on the, on the television and I start watching that stuff, you know, a couple of weeks from now, I'm going to think I need a Kawasaki jet ski to feel like a man. You know what I mean? Like, ah. <laughs> like it's, it's just, it's constantly a barrage, right? Yeah. And so I don't need that, man. I don't need the ninjas at the gates always trying to get in and convince me of stuff. And yeah. so a, a big part of, you know, what I do and I always kind of talk to my students and my patients about all the time and is – an information fast from the mass media if you are starting to feel like you're getting down on the world being a crappy place, right? Because you turn on the news and it's all death, 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 and there's a panda, there's a new panda at the zoo, and then cut, right? It's it's not good news, and it's always, you know, kind of making you feel like the world's a crazy place, and then the advertisements in between there are telling you that, you know, you if you were to take this drug, you'd feel better, Mm -hmm. right? So there's a, like I said, there's a lot of neuroscience, and there's just a lot of thinking that goes into what what happens there and so you know uh, uh, you know call me a hippie but i'm a nature dude you know go for a hike grab the dogs go up you know go up with your wife or your girlfriend or whatever and just walk around the neighborhood go to your local farmers market do things that are community oriented and 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 involve being around people and pressing the flesh and just getting to know you know who who's in your neighborhood because getting locked into a box and and, and the the dimensionality of kind of you know having your entire interface with reality being an iPad on your sofa while the TV's telling you what to think yeah. is very very dangerous right and <laughs> and it's creating a, a class of people that are thinking they need Adderall to pay attention and Lunesta to sleep and, and metformin to digest, you know, food and, and, and you know, laxatives to poop. And, it, and it's a litany of things, right? Like we did this uh, spoof on these advertise, uh, advertisements for um, the pharmaceuticals and we made up some false drug called Suprato and we had this whole kind of joking litany of things that it'll do to you. And then it went viral on the internet because everyone's like, oh my God, that sounds just like the rest of them. And we were trying to be punchy. You know what I mean? I was trying to go over the top and I couldn't really make it sound that much more ridiculous than what people wow. are hearing every day. <laughs> right? It's just like, oh my God, this is this is about as close as it is, right? It's an approximation of the real thing, yeah. which is crazy. I'm trying to make fun of it and I can't even do it well enough. Yeah. Right? It's so true, isn't it? Oh, right. It's like I, I would have to show like, you know, heads severed or something to get over the top, because if not, people would just go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is so nuts. I never thought about it that way. But yeah, it's impossible to make fun of it because it's already so freaking ridiculous. That's right. That's right. It's like the reality. It's stranger than fiction. Yeah. And, and so if we could step back and look at it in that way, we got to scratch our heads and say, what have we done? Yeah. Right. What have we done? Where, how far, how, how far are we going to go in the false promise of medicine until we go back to just good, clean, healthy living? The stuff that you stand for, right? Just, yeah. just learning how to eat, learning how to live correctly, drinking your water, and, and, and just you know. And, and I'm jealous that you're standing right now because I hate sitting. <laughs> Right, and just you know, not being at your desk as often as you need to, and just taking care of business and staying moving. Right, yeah. we are moving creatures. Yeah. Yeah, and sitting, I I can just tell the amount of energy that I have or, or don't have when I'm sitting. It's just down the tooth, unless I'm sucking down a huge coffee, which I do like to do at coffee shops from time to time. But yes, standing has been like one of the best things that I've done on this show. And all of you who have been listening to me in the past, I don't know, probably two or three months, maybe you've even noticed a difference in, in my voice because mm. I am standing and I feel so much better and I can gesticulate in a way that I couldn't before. And it's, mm. it's just, there's more vitality there. So mm. why don't we wrap up? What is one thing that, that people listening can do today to improve their lives? Uh, great question. You know, what, what we talk about is, um, you know, cause after vitality, the movie came out and we screened it to a few thousand people and everyone's like, Oh my God, I love it. I love it. Um, now what? And so what I really had to kind of sit down and think about the now what because I wanted to make it salient. And what we really came up with was what we call the vitality challenge, which is, okay, diet, exercise, sleep, mindset. Okay, pick one thing in each of those categories 
and do it every day for 100 days. And I'm not talking about lifting the Eiffel Tower or something. I'm saying like, okay, stop taking coffee after noon if you're having trouble sleeping, right? Uh, you know, go paleo for 100 days. You know, do your push-ups or, or whatever it is or stretch out. If you're a desk jockey, like stretch your hip flexors for 100 days. But do one thing in each of those categories for 100 days because then you're kind of globally addressing like this whole lifestyle thing. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be huge, right? You know, first like 10, 20 days, some people go, okay, yeah, I kind of feel a little better. But after 100 days, their lives are changed. Mm -hmm. um, it's not rocket science. But again, you know, the same science that's telling you you need Lunesta is, is burning into your nervous system new habits that are within 100 days going to change the way that you operate, right? Mm -hmm. And what I, do, I don't want the health you know, window opening, I want it part of the operating system, right, in my own consciousness. And so doing these little things, I say, makes a big difference. And, and we've been testing it with hundreds, I think, at this point, into the thousands of people. And, um, you know, it's amazing the stories that you get from the the, the small, small, meaningful steps that happen. And, and, and that's kind of the, the take home message is, you know, tomorrow, someone's going to come out and say, oh, broccoli extract is going to change your life. And then no, no, now it's resveratrol. Now it's like, you know what, I have to swallow this tin and it's going to do such, <laughs> such wonderful things. And this is this whole kind of this, this thing about popularizing the next greatest thing in medicine. Mm -hmm. And I really got to, you know, say that my whole stance on that is step back, go back to good, clean, healthy living and get out of the hype. Um, and yes, there's wonderful things that we're discovering every day and they're, they're super useful. But if you can get your operating system to understand that it's the day to day throttle that really determines your health, Right. It's not the I'm going to work my my tail off and then like, you know, go collapse in a hammock in Maui. Mm -hmm. But learning how to manage my stress on a day to day basis and learning how to not get stressed out and interface with the world in a way that that doesn't knock me off my perch. Yeah. Right. It, it, it's that feast or famine kind of thing that that really kind of is is permeating the consciousness of, of, of the Western world, which I think is the primary disease of, of, of health because we don't understand how to look at health in a meaningful kind of long tail way. Yeah. And once that changes and the way we look at it changes, I think that the rest of it will, will come around pretty quickly. Oh, that's killer. I'm going to take so many sound bites from this. <laughs> <laughs> All yours, brother. All yours, man. Please do, because you know we're all we're all fighting the good fight here. We're trying to help people, and we're trying to bring our our neighbors up so that it becomes we live by example, and we're all cruising and kind of doing the, doing this together, right? And, and it's not like oh, I want to be a health ambassador, and then I got all these followers. I want everyone that's listening to this radio show to step up and be an example for the people in their lives, right? Yeah, because um, I, I think it's the most patriotic thing that we could do. I don't know how much of your your audience is U.S. versus international, or whatever, but it's you know truly patriotic to step up and be. I mean, think about the cowboys, right? You know, when they're out there on the frontier, you know, it's like you can't afford to get injured or sick, so you take care of yourself. It's not like there's a doctor waiting with an ambulance to come pick you up and charge you twenty grand for for some you know blip that you had. You said, you've got to stay healthy, and you know this when you're out like in the back country, right? Yeah. Actually, yeah, I know first aid, you know, I did the doctor thing, but you know, you know what the best way of, you know, getting home alive is, is not getting into trouble. Yeah. Right. And so that, that frame of thinking, and that's why I really like the outdoors because it shows us that it, yeah. it, it helps us model how we should live our lives and not be dependent on other people for our health. Right. It gives us a bit of that kind of individualistic spirit. Yeah. You know, uh, so like I said, I just got back from Thailand and it was so interesting to see the cultural difference between uh, what's allowed there and what's not allowed here. You know what I mean? Like, even with, so, we rented scooters and we're scooting all around the islands, and there are like no traffic laws, and it's not like you need a special license or whatever. And like here in Austin, we even looked into it, you need like a special motorcycle license in order to ride a scooter over 50 cc's. Uh, and I think you even need one for one that's less than 50 cc's. And like, you know, obviously, we have all these traffic rules, and you need to have everything registered and inspected and there are just you know all these mind numbing details that you need to pay attention to to make our system work um and not to say that their system is perfect over there but it's certainly different and that in a way worked too and another example was like we were <laughs> we were walking through this cave that you know clearly no one had really been to and there were just like n there was nothing up to protect you from falling deep into an abyss and never being found again like it was basically just like don't be an idiot and fall off the edge but in america it's like 
that that pretty much wouldn't happen, right? You, you're strapped in anywhere you go. You have to wear a spelunking helmet, even if you're you know walking through an archway. It's just such a different world. Absolutely, and I think that it's a very astute uh, point that you're making because it again, it's that personal responsibility. Don't be an idiot. That's a hole. And if you fall down that hole, it's going to hurt and no one's going to save you. Right. <laughs> and so the American kind of false promises, oh, well, if you fall down the hole, we'll, you know, we'll send down a helicopter and the SWAT team and maybe an aircraft carrier and we'll get you out because mm-hmm. this is how we do. Um, and it gets people it, it in it basically creates this this frame of mind where you can walk around like a zombie. Because you don't have that personal responsibility of, of needing to be aware and paying attention at every given moment. Yeah. And you're right. I've been on the scooters in Thailand and boy, you know, you could die. And you so, need to be aware. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. That's right. It's not like, oh, well, my insurance agent will take care of this. Right. right? Like you will die. And so you're, you're hyper aware. It's, it's, you know, I, I, I think that that scooter in Thailand is a lot closer to the tracking of the lion in Africa yeah. than anything we have here in the West. Because, you know, you're on the phone and you're, you know, I, I voice text in my phone and all this kind of stuff <laughs> as I'm on, you know, on the road and all this kind of stuff. And it's just like, holy crap, how many more things can I multitask on while I'm going 80 miles an hour? Yeah. Um, and it's, here's the problem too, is if you crash your car in the United States and you kill a family of five, you actually have supported the economy. The GDP goes up. The body shop, the morgue, the ambulance, the attorneys, everyone's making money, right? Now, is that a good thing? No, absolutely not, right? But it's a positive indicator for the economy. And so, you know, and this is a Bhutan has this gross happiness index that they've influenced, they put in there. So it has this checks and balances. Mm -hmm. So if people are unhappy and the economy is doing well, they make adjustments to make people happy, Mm -hmm. right? And it's this this model that everyone's been looking at uh, saying, okay, can we bring that over to the West? Because a horrible, tragic thing shouldn't be a positive marker on any chart, right? And, and so we're just now looking at how we can re, reanalyze the way we see everything in our capitalistic model. It has the same thing to do with healthcare, right? Oh, this guy got cancer. That's good for business, yeah. right? Well, it's horrible for everything else, but it's really good for business. And that's not, a, that's not the kind of business. Like in Buddhism, we call it right, right livelihood, right? It's like I'm in the business of helping these people, but I shouldn't be stoked because I'm, you know, I'm going to get to pay for my Ferrari now, yeah. right? And, and and so there's this whole checks and balances thing. And I'm not saying the oncologist is evil. I'm just saying the way the system is structured is kind of screwy. Right. And we're all – and I'm not saying I have the answers. I'm saying we all just need to look at this. Yeah, and at least right? you're fighting the good fight. Well, that's it. That's yeah. it. You know, <laughs> at, least, at least I'm opening my eyes and looking and, and trying to raise awareness as, as the rest of us are. But I know that if we all pull ourselves up and get healthier and more awake and more vibrantly alive, uh, we have a much better perspective and we could all be part of a solution instead of waiting for someone to tell us what the solution is. That's not going to happen, guys. Yeah. You know, To all the listeners out there, no, don't wait for someone to tell you what the solution is. Be part of it and then belong. Right. Oh, and that's... And that's 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 brilliant. I love that. So we're out of time, but uh, quickly, why don't you tell folks where they can find you and, and your newest project? Awesome. Well.org. Come to Well.org. It's kind of the hub of all the stuff that we're doing. Um, and it's uh, it's something that I'm proud of. We, we got uh, this whole model of symbiotic capitalism and just cool things that we're doing. So come check us out. And uh, we're here to support you. And we're doing all kinds of stories all the time, uh, putting cameras on the good guys. So so cool. Yeah. And, and it's well.org is awesome. I highly encourage all you folks to check it out. Pedram, thanks so much for coming on the show. I would love to have you back again soon. This is awesome. I could have talked for 18 hours about this. Oh, I love it. <laughs> love it. You know, anytime, uh, you know, I just, I feel like I'm hanging out the whole time when I'm talking to you. So yeah, absolutely, man. Thank you for having me and I look forward to seeing you again. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thank you.